3. Attar of Nishapur Although Attar is one of the greatest of Sufi classical literary masters and an inspirer of Rumi, his memorials of the saints, tales and teachings of Sufi sages had to wait nearly seven and a half centuries for an English translation. In spite of the accelerating Western interest in Sufism, it was the Hindu hermit Dr. Banki Bihari who published 62 selections from this book in 1961. Attar wrote in all about 114 books, among which the most famous are the Sufic Divine Book, The Parliament of the Birds, and The Book of Counsel. His teachings were carried on by means of illustrative biography, fables, maxims, and apologues, which contain not only moral teaching, but allegories describing specific stages in human development. In the Parliament of the Birds, for instance, he sketches individual phases in human consciousness, though these are represented as happening to different individuals or to a whole community. Attar used the theme of a journey or quest as an analogy of the successive stages of the human soul in search of perfection. Refusing to accept honours from the hands of the Mongol invaders of Central Asia, he is reported to have died at the hands of the soldiers of Genghis Khan after having dismissed his disciples, sending them to places of safety, when he predicted the Mongol invasion of the 13th century. The traditions of Sufism assert that Attar's work is important because, read as a whole, it helps to maintain the social fabric and ethical standards of Islam, while special selections from it contain initiatory material which is concealed by the heavily theological parts. An Answer of Jesus Some Israelites reviled Jesus one day as he was walking through their part of the town. But he answered by repeating prayers in their name. Someone said to him, You prayed for these men. Did you not feel incensed against them? He answered, I could spend only of what I had in my purse. The Heart Someone went up to a madman who was weeping in the bitterest possible way. He said, Why do you cry? The madman answered, I am crying to attract the pity of his heart. The other told him, Your words are nonsense, for he has no physical heart. The madman answered, It is you who are wrong, for he is the owner of all the hearts which exist. Through the heart you can make your connection with God. On being offered an unacceptable donation. What? Would you with a sum of money erase my name from the register of dervishes? The Tale of Fazal Rabin One day, a penurious old man went to see Fazal Rabi to discuss some matter or other. Because of weakness and nervousness, this ancient stuck the iron point of his walking stick to wound Fazal Rabi's foot. Listening courteously to what the old man had to say, Fazal Rabi said no word, although he went pale and then flushed, from the pain of the wound and the iron as it stayed lodged in his foot. Then, when the other had finished his business, he took a paper from him and put his signature to it. When the old man had gone, delighted that he had been successful in his application, Fazal Rabi allowed himself to collapse. One of the attendant nobles said, My lord, you sat there with blood pouring from your foot, with that old man in his dotage piercing it with his iron-tipped staff, and you said nothing, nothing at all. Fazal Rabi answered, I made no sign of pain, because I feared that the old man's distress might cause him to withdraw in confusion, and that he might abandon his application for my help. Poor as he was, how could I add to his troubles in that manner? Be a real man. Learn nobility of thought and action, like that of Fazal Rabi. The Slave Without a Master Wandering in a patchwork robe, his face blackened by the sun, a certain dervish arrived at Kufa, where he was seen by a merchant. The merchant spoke to him and decided that he must be a lost slave. Because of your mild manner, I will call you Kair. Good, he said. Are you not a slave? 
That I am, said Kai. I will take you home, and you can work for me until I find your master. I would like that, said Kai, for I have been seeking my master for such a long time. He worked for many years with this man, who taught him to be a weaver, hence his second name, Nasaj, weaver. After his long services, feeling guilty of his exploitation, the merchant said to him, I do not know who you are, but you are now free to go. Kaya Nasaj, the great master of the way, travelled onward to Mecca without regrets, for he had discovered how to continue his development in spite of having no name and being treated like a slave. He was the teacher of Shibli, Ibrahim Kawas, and many more of the great teachers of the Sufis. He died over a thousand years ago, at the age of one hundred and twenty. The Magic Box A man once wanted to sell a rough carpet, and he made a public offer of it in the street. The first man to whom he showed it said, This is a coarse carpet and very worn. And he bought it cheaply. Then the buyer stood up and said to another who was walking along, Here is a carpet soft as silk, none is like it. A Sufi who was passing by had listened to the buying and the attempted selling of one and the same carpet with two different descriptions. The Sufi said to the carpet seller, Please, carpet man, put me in your magic box, which can turn a rough carpet into a smooth one, perhaps a nothing into a jewel. The Moon The moon was asked, What is your strongest desire? It answered, That the sun should vanish and should remain veiled forever in clouds. The Five Hundred Gold Pieces one of Junaid's followers came to him with a purse containing five hundred gold pieces. "'Have you any more money than this?' asked the Sufi. "'Yes, I have.' "'Do you desire more?' Well, "'Yes, I do.' "'Then you must keep it, for you are more in need than I, for I have nothing and desire nothing. You have a great deal and still want more.' The Madman and the Muezzin a muezzin in Isfahan had climbed to the top of a minaret and was giving the call to prayer. Meanwhile, a madman was passing by, and someone asked him, What is he doing there in that minaret? The madman said, That man up there is in fact shaking a nutshell which has nothing within it. When you speak the ninety-nine names of God, you are, similarly, playing with a hollow nutshell. How can God be understood through names? Since you cannot speak in words about the essence of God, best of all speak about nobody at all. Kitab Allahi The Religious Framework One day, when the companion Omar was looking through a Jewish holy book, the Prophet Muhammad said to him, You are too casual with that book. If you want to gain any value from it, you will have to become a Jew. To be a perfect Jew is better than to be an incomplete Muslim and dallying with the Jewish book is half-hearted and will give you no benefit one way or the other. Your mistake is that you are neither one thing nor another in behaving in this manner. You do not believe, neither do you disbelieve. What then is your condition? How can it be described? Kitab Alahi A Story of Moses Once Moses was asking God to show him one of God's friends and a voice answered, Go to a certain valley, and there you will find one who loves, one of the chosen who treads the path. Moses went and found this man, dressed in rags, plagued by every kind of insect and crawling thing. He said, Can I do anything for you? The man answered, Emissary of God, bring me a cup of water, for I am thirsty. When Moses returned with the water, he found the man lying dead. He went away to look for a piece of cloth for a winding sheet. When he came back, he found that the body had been all but devoured by a desert lion. Moses was distressed beyond measure, and cried out, All-powerful and all-knowing one, you convert mud into human beings. 
Some are carried to paradise, others driven through tortures. One is happy, another in misery. This is the paradox which none can understand. Then an inner voice spoke to Moses, saying, This man has relied upon us for drink and then turned back from that trust. He relied upon Moses for his sustenance, trusting in an intermediary. His was the fault in asking for help from another, after having been content with us. Your heart attaches itself again and again to objects. You have to know how to keep the connection with your origins. Ilahi Nama Souls Before the Creation of the Body Know about the time when there were souls and no bodies. This was a time of a few years, but each of those years was one of our millennia. The souls were all arrayed in line. The world was presented to their sight. Nine out of ten of the souls ran towards it. Then paradise was presented to the remaining souls. Out of these, nine out of ten ran towards it. Then hell was shown to the remaining souls. Nine out of ten of them ran away from it in horror. Then there were only a few souls, those who were affected by nothing at all. They had not been attracted by the earth or by paradise, nor had they feared hell. The celestial voice spoke to these survivors, saying, Idiot souls, what is it that you want? The souls answered in unison, You who know all, know that it is you whom we desire, and that we do not desire to leave your presence. The voice said to them, Desire of us is perilous, causes hardship and innumerable perils. The souls answered him, We will gladly experience anything for the sake of being with you, and lose everything in order that we may gain everything. Ilahi Nama The Test It is related of Shakik of Balkh that he once said to his disciples, I put my confidence in God and went through the wilderness with only a small coin in my pocket. I went on the pilgrimage and came back, and the coin is still with me. One of the youths stood up and said to Shakik, If you had a coin in your pocket, how could you say that you relied upon anything higher? Shakik answered, There is nothing for me to say, for this young man is right. When you rely upon the invisible world, there is no place for anything, however small, as a provision. Kitab Alahi About Muhammad, son of Isa Muhammad, son of Isa, was one of the boon companions of the commander of the faithful. Because of the agility of his thought, he surpassed all others. One day he was riding through the Baghdad streets, accompanied by a multitude of attendants. The people asked one another, Who is this man, so dazzlingly bedecked, so well mounted, so rich? And one old woman who was hobbling along answered them, That is a poor man, not a rich one. For, had Allah not denied him his favour, he would not have such vanity as this. Hearing this, Muhammad, son of Isa, dismounted at once from his gorgeously caparisoned horse, and admitted that this indeed was his condition. From that moment he abandoned all desire for outward show and wealth. The Perception of the Madman there was a certain madman who would not take part in congregational prayers. One Friday, after much difficulty, people induced him to attend. But as soon as the leader of the prayer started to recite, the madman started to bellow like an ox. The people, assuming that he was only reverting to madness, but at the same time desirous of helping him, challenged him afterwards. Have you no idea of God that you should make a noise like an animal in the middle of a believing congregation? But the madman said, I was only doing what the prayer leader was doing. When he intoned, he was buying an ox, and I spoke like an ox. When this strange remark was reported to the leader of the prayer, he confessed, When I was saying God is greatest of all, I was in fact thinking about my farm. And when I got to the phrase, Praise to God, I thought that I would buy an ox. It was at that moment that I heard something bellowing. 
The Miser and the Angel of Death A miser had accumulated by effort, trade and lending, 300,000 dinars. He had lands and buildings and all kinds of wealth. He then decided that he would spend a year in enjoyment, living comfortably, and then decide as to what his future should be. But almost as soon as he had stopped amassing money, the angel of death appeared before him to take his life away. The miser tried by every argument which he could muster to dissuade the angel, who seemed, however, adamant. Then the man said, Grant me but three more days, and I will give you one third of my possessions. The angel refused, and pulled again at the miser's life, tugging to take it away. Then the man said, If you will only allow me two more days on earth, I will give you two hundred thousand dinars from my store. But the angel would not listen to him, and the angel even refused to give the man a solitary extra day for all his three hundred thousand pieces. Then the miser said, Please, then, give me just time enough to write one little thing down. This time the angel allowed him this single concession, and the man wrote with his own blood, Man, make use of your life. I could buy not one hour for three hundred thousand dinars. Make sure that you realize the value of your time. The Donkey's Head An idiot saw a donkey's head on a stick in a garden. He asked, What is that doing there? He was told, It has been put there to avert the evil eye. The fool replied, You are the one with ass's brains, and that's why you have set up an ass's head. When it was alive, it could not prevent the blows of the stick from hitting it. Now, when dead, how can it repel the evil eye? Absurdity and Ignorance What seems to be absurdity and is not, is better than the ignorance of the man who thinks it is absurd. Light The true lover finds the light only if, like the candle, he is his own fuel, consuming himself. Christians and Muslims A Christian once became a Muslim. The very next day, however, he began to drink wine. His mother, coming upon him in a drunken state, said, My son, what are you doing? In acting this way you have spurned Jesus, and you have also failed to please Muhammad. Stay in the belief which is yours. Nobody can be a man and worship idols as well as holding to another faith. The Tree Unaware of Its State A man cut down a tree one day. A Sufi who saw this taking place said, Look at this fresh branch which is full of sap, happy because it does not yet know that it has been cut off. Ignorant of the damage which it has suffered it may be, but it will know in due time. Meanwhile, you cannot reason with it. This severance, this ignorance, these are the state of man. The Arrow When an arrow is loosed from the bow, it may go straight, or it may not, according to whatever the archer does. How strange, therefore, that when the arrow speeds without deviation, it is due to the skill of the archer. But when it goes out of true, it is the arrow which receives the maledictions. King Mahmud and the Beans The mighty King Mahmud of Ghazna, out hunting one day, was separated from his party. He came upon the smoke of a small fire and rode to the spot, where he found an old woman with a pot. Mahmud said, You have as guest today the monarch. What are you cooking on your fire? The crone said, This is a bean stew. The emperor asked her, Old lady, will you not give me some? I will not, she said, for this is only for me. Your kingdom is not worth what these beans are worth. You may want my beans, but I don't want anything you have. My beans are worth a hundred times more than all you have. Look at your enemies, who challenge your possessions in every particular. I am free, and I have my own beans. The mighty Mahmud looked at the undisputed owner of the beans, thought of his disputed domains, and wept. 
unaware. You know nothing of yourself here and in this state. You are like the wax in the honeycomb. What does it know of fire or guttering? When it gets to the stage of the waxen candle, and when light is emitted, then it knows. Similarly, you will know that when you were alive, you were dead, and only thought yourself alive. The Madman and the Wrestler A tipsy madman called after the coffin bearers of a funeral. Who is this man who has fallen into the claws of death? They answered, Madman. This is the body of a champion wrestler, a young man who is in the prime of his life. The madman said, He died through the power of a mighty adversary, not knowing that this would happen to him. The Two Rings A man loved two women equally. They asked him to tell them which one was his favourite. He asked them to wait for a time until his decision should be known. Then he had two rings made, each exactly resembling the other. To each of the women, separately, he gave one ring. Then he called them together and said, The one whom I love best is she who has the ring. This, too, will pass. A powerful king, ruler of many domains, was in a position of such magnificence that wise men were his mere employees. And yet one day he felt himself confused and called the sages to him. He said, I do not know the cause, but something impels me to seek a certain ring, one that will enable me to stabilize my state. I must have such a ring, and this ring must be one which, when I am unhappy, will make me joyful. At the same time, if I am happy and look upon it, I must be made sad. The wise men consulted one another, and threw themselves into deep contemplation, and finally they came to a decision as to the character of this ring which would suit their king. The ring which they devised was one upon which was inscribed the legend, This, too, will pass. The King Who Divined His Future A king, who was also an astrologer, read in his stars that on a certain day, and at a particular hour, a calamity would overtake him. He therefore built a house of solid rock, and posted numerous guardians outside. One day, when he was within, he realised that he could still see daylight. He found an opening which he filled up, to prevent misfortune entering. In blocking this door, he made himself a prisoner with his own hands. And because of this, the king died. This Space On a wall within the Tekia arches of the Meditation Hall of Atta, it is related, were written the words, Reserved for the sage Hakim Tamtim. Sheikh Atta instructed his senior disciples to observe the behaviour of all newcomers towards this inscription. He predicted that all who reacted to it in a certain fashion would develop mystical powers correctly and rapidly, and that all who said or did certain other things would leave or have to be sent away. He never asked the disciples which postulant reacted in which way, but they observed over the years that it turned out always as he predicted. One day he was asked why he left this inscription there. He said, It is to show those without perceptions that apparently insignificant indications to certain experiences will betray the inner capacities, or lack of them, to one who knows how to make a test.